The holiday season is a time of togetherness, of celebration, of joy, of being with the ones you love and being thankful for the things and people that you have. But one man decided to use the holidays as a backdrop for his evil plan to execute everyone in his family. What you are about to hear is believed to be real. Based on witness accounts, testimonies, and public record, this is Terrifying and True. In the history of humankind, there are many tragic stories of patriarchs of the family killing those closest to them for a number of reasons, often economic stressors or mental illness. But this case is truly another level of heinous. This is the story of Ronald Gene Simmons, a name I honestly wish we could all forget, a man who not only was a heinous human being who committed many atrocities against those who he loved and loved him, but when he decided to commit the ultimate crime against them, he did so at Christmas time. We'll be telling that story tonight on Terrifying and True after these quick words from our sponsors. The Christmas season is a time most think of as one for hope, the pinnacle of the human spirit, and a time one spends with their family regardless of any headaches that may come about. But the holiday season is also known to produce darker memories than the ones found on a Hallmark Christmas card. While it is usually robbery, personal larceny, and road-related crimes that fill the news come the holidays, murder has also filled the headlines. In 1987, one such instance of Mary murder entered the headlines, only this one had a build-up to it that included a constantly moving childhood, a decorated military career, fleeing from the authorities when investigated for sexually abusing their own child, and a string of low-paying jobs that appeared to slowly chip away at their sanity. Eventually, that sanity broke, and the individual started a days-long spree of murder and mayhem. This is the story of a Christmas gone chaotic and how a family was slaughtered by its patriarch, how perhaps a demented mind was slowly distorted even more so by circumstance, of how the red that makes up the color scheme of the holidays can drip with blood. This is the story of Robert Jean Simmons. During the lead-up to the Christmas season of 1987, 47-year-old Ronald Jean Simmons decided that he would kill all the members of his family. After years of low-paying jobs, living in less than desirable conditions, and dealing with the repercussions of allegations of fathering a child with his own 17-year-old daughter, he was simply pushed into the direction of killing all of those around him. Thus, on the morning of December 22nd, he began a new job as an executioner. First was his wife, Rebecca, and his eldest son, Jean. He killed them by bludgeoning them with a crowbar and then shooting them with a 22 caliber pistol. Next was his three-year-old granddaughter, Barbara, who he killed by strangulation. To dispose of the bodies... Simmons dumped the three victims into cesspits previously made by his children due to the lack of indoor plumbing in their converted mobile home. With the three victims dealt with, Simmons waited for the remaining children to return home from school for their Christmas break. Once they arrived, he told them he had a surprise for them, but wanted to deliver them to the children one at a time. The first in this batch of victims was 17-year-old Loretta, another one of his daughters. He killed her by strangling her and held her head down in a rain-filled barrel. After that, one by one, Simmons killed the remaining three children, Eddie, Marianne, and Becky, 
in the same fashion. When all four of the children were dead, Simmons dumped their bodies into the cesspit where the previous victims were. Four days later, on December 26th, Simmons waited for the remaining family members he'd invited over for the holidays to come. To start off his newest spree of executions, Simmons first killed his son Billy and his wife Renata, both shot dead. Simmons then moved on to their 20-month-old son Trey by strangling and drowning him. Next was his eldest daughter Sheila, with whom he'd had a sexually abusive relationship, and her husband Dennis McNulty by shooting them both. Simmons next murdered his child conceived by his abuse of Sheila, seven-year-old Sylvia, by strangling her. Finally, Simmons finished his familicide by killing his 21-month-old grandson, Michael. Now that all of his family was slain, Simmons placed his victims' bodies in the lounge of their home in neat rows. He covered their bodies with coats, except for that of Sheila, who was covered by Rebecca Simmons' best tablecloth. The bodies of Trey and Michael were wrapped in plastic sheeting and left in abandoned cars at the end of the lane. After the murders, Simmons drove to a Sears store in Russellville, where he retrieved Christmas lights that he had previously ordered for his family. That night, he went for a drink at a local bar before returning to the home, where he spent the rest of the evening and the following day drinking beer and watching television. However, even with his entire family now dead, the darkness in Simmons was not at peace. So then came the next phase of his violent plan. On December 28th, Simmons drove out to a Walmart in Russellville, where he bought another gun to use for his next attack. From there, he traveled to a law firm where he had previously met the 24-year-old secretary, Kathy Cribbins Kendrick. Simmons had an infatuation with Kendrick and had asked her out previously with her rejecting him. Once at the law office, Simmons walked in, found Kendrick, and shot her dead. Next on the tour of murder was the office of an oil company. It was there that Simmons was intending to find and kill Russell Taylor, the owner of the company. Taylor was also the owner of the Sinclair Mini Mart, where Simmons had resigned just before his killing spree. He was able to find and shoot Taylor, but was unsuccessful in killing him. Simmons then turned his attention to 33-year-old James David Chaffin, whom he successfully shot and killed. Chaffin would be the only victim that Simmons did not know. Before leaving the building, Simmons fired at another stranger, but luckily for that stranger, the bullet had missed. After completing his work at the oil company, Simmons drove out to the Sinclair Mini Mart, where he shot and wounded two more people. His final target was the office of the Woodline Motor Freight Company, where he shot his former supervisor twice, wounding her. When done attacking his former supervisor, Simmons aimed at an employee and told them to call the police, holding that employee at gunpoint until the cops arrived. Once they did, Simmons handed over his firearm and surrendered without any resistance. His rampage lasted 40 minutes. After he was arrested, Simmons underwent typical psychiatric testing to determine whether or not he was fit to stand trial. He was deemed fit and went on trial on May 12, 1988 for the murders of Kathleen Kendrick and James David Chaffin. Simmons was found guilty and sentenced to death. While under oath, Simmons made a statement supporting the court's decision to execute him, saying, quote, I, Ronald Gene Simmons Sr., want it to be known that it is my wish and my desire that absolutely no action by anybody be taken to appeal or in any way change this sentence. It is further respectfully requested that this sentence be carried out expeditiously. Next, Simmons went on trial for the murder of his 14 family members. On February 10, 1989, he was once more found guilty and again sentenced to death. During the trial, Simmons had to be removed from the courtroom for punching the prosecutor, John Bynum, and trying to grab a deputy's handgun. After Bynum had introduced a letter between Simmons and his daughter, Sheila, in which Simmons expressed anger that Sheila had revealed that he was the father of her child and that he 
would see her in hell. As for his motive, a family friend told investigators that Simmons' wife, Rebecca, had been saving up money to divorce him when the killings happened. Once again, Simmons did not appeal his sentence and stated, quote, To those who oppose the death penalty, in my particular case, anything short of death would be cruel and unusual punishment. Because of his acceptance and lack of desire to contest his death sentences, the trial court held a hearing concerning his competency in regards to his opinion to waive all further proceedings. By the end of the hearing, the court concluded that Simmons's decision was knowing and intelligent. However, it was his acceptance that raised some issues with Simmons and his fellow death row inmates. He had to be separated from other prisoners as his life was threatened constantly. This was because he refused to appeal his death sentence. The other prisoners believed Simmons was damaging their chances of beating their own death sentences. Simmons even became the subject of the United States Supreme Court case Whitmer v. Arkansas when another death row inmate, Jonas Whitmore, attempted unsuccessfully to force an appeal of Simmons' case. On May 31, 1990, then-Arkansas governor and later president, Bill Clinton signed the execution warrant for Simmons. He selected lethal injection as his means of execution and died on June 25 in the Cummins unit. Because none of his remaining relatives would claim his body, Simmons was buried in a potter's field in Lincoln County, Arkansas. And so ends the holiday horror tale of Ronald Gene Simmons, the man who became the state of Arkansas's most prolific mass murderer, and whose acceptance of and his refusal to appeal his sentence resulted in a Supreme Court case. While a motive was partially established, nobody may ever know what fully triggered Simmons to go on the rampage that he did. Was it vengeance? Was it to try to cover up a dark, dirty family secret? Why was he so accepting of his sentence? The truth might never be fully revealed, but perhaps that is for the best in matters such as this. All we know for sure, though, is that Ronald Gene Simmons committed a week-long holiday rampage that still has people talking to this day, almost as if it was another Christmas story to tell come the season. Hey, my spookies. I gotta say something, dead serious. This story is truly devastating. It's about a man who harmed his family for a long time and then one day decided to just kill them and at the holidays. This is the kind of brutal reality that makes true crime so fascinating and also so heartbreaking at the same time. I wanted to tell this story because obviously it's seasonal and it's morbid and it's twisted. But I also have to admit that doing terrifying and true can be kind of hard on my spirit sometimes. Reading these true stories of very, very heinous crime. So that being said, for the rest of the holiday season, I'm taking a break from terrifying and true. I want to stick to the mayhem and carnage that's of the fictional variety. And we have plenty of it. Lots of bonus shows to come this holiday season. As you probably already noticed, we've been publishing pretty much every day since the start of December. So, next Monday, I hope you'll enjoy tuning in for a little something extra under the tree. A holiday-themed horror story of the fictional variety. I figured you'd understand. Merry Christmas. Terrifying and True is narrated by Enrique Couto. This episode is written by Morgan Moore. It's executive produced by Rob Fields, produced by Daniel Wilder, with original theme music by Ray Mattis. If you have a story you'd like us to cover on the program, send us an email at weeklyspooky at gmail.com. And if you want to support us in a very direct way, go to weeklyspooky.com and click on Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you can support us and allow us to keep the spooky rolling and rolling and rolling. And I want to say a big thank you to our Patreon podcast booster, folks who pay just a little bit more to hear their names at the end of the show. And they are John Kalen, Johnny Nix, Bobbletopia.com, Megan Hua, Julia Kirsch, Brent McCullough, Steve King, Karen Wiemet, Jack Kerr, and Craig Cohen. Thank you all so much. 
And we'll see you next time right here on Weekly Spooky and Terrifying and True.